Heavenly Father, I ask that your spirit rest with us as it has in the past to help us understand your word. May it continue to be with us today. As we open your word for a challenging word, may it lead us into a deeper relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. And as we know him more, may we know you, Father. May we know the spirit more in Jesus' most beautiful name. Amen. If I uh, had to divide the last book of Revelation, right, uh, up into two chapters, not 22 chapters, but two chapters, where we are today in the series of looking at the whole book of Revelation, we would say that we are coming to the end of chapter one, right? We're just coming to the end of chapter one. And as you know, we began with kind of like an, an epic beginning of the book. It was pretty fantastic inside then. And as you come to the end of your first chapter, if you only have two chapters in this book, you would have to say that the bar has to be raised. Well, my friends, consider the bar raised, <laughs> all right? Today is a radical warning. Just when you thought you were going to get comfortable, today is a radical warning. But first, in case you're brand new today and you haven't seen the series, and I met a few people who haven't been here for the first couple of weeks, I'm just going to explain a few instructions, and, uh, and this will help you with it. And, and so I'm going to state a sentence. Uh, I'm going to show you the sentence. And, and those of you who've been here know what I'm going to say next. And then you're going to repeat it with me. It's very, very tricky, I know. I'm going to say a sentence. I'm going to show you the sentence, and then you're going to repeat it with me. And this are three rules that I think will help us understand Revelation as we go through. So, first, I will pace myself. Now you get to see it, right? And we say it together. I will pace myself. You've got to resist the urge to know everything instantly in the book of Revelation. I do not know everything in the book of Revelation. You do not know everything in the book of Revelation. Beware of anyone who tells you they know everything in the book of Revelation because nobody does. Right. Second, I will enjoy the journey. Number two here, ready? You see it? I will enjoy the journey. The book of Revelation is from Jesus. It is about Jesus. We get to know more about Jesus and the full character of God. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be engaging and challenging at the same time. Third, this was true then and it is true now. This was true then and it is true now. It meant something back then, and it means something for us now. And everything is written in symbolic code so that we can understand this. Now, it made a lot of sense back then, and when we looked at, if you've looked at the First Testament, some people refer to that as the Old Testament. I feel like the First Testament is a much friendlier title for it, so I refer to it as the First and Second Testament. The First Testament, it really helps you to understand a lot of this, especially when you know that 78% of the book of Revelation comes from the First Testament. So we looked at the seven churches, we looked at the seven seals, and now this week we'll look at the seven trumpets. And here's the thing, all of them, all of them begin in the sanctuary. In fact, I'll let you into this little secret. Everything begins in the sanctuary. As we go forward in the next few weeks, you're going to see that the sanctuary has a pretty major role in the whole book of Revelation. And I know you're asking right now, really? Everything begins in the sanctuary? I, I didn't pick up on that. So let me just show you really quickly. The churches, Revelation chapter 1, 19 to 20, Christ He's holding a lampstand. He's walking around in the lampstands. He's dressed up as a high priest. It begins in the sanctuary. The seals, Revelation 4 and 5, is a throne scene. It's kind of in the sanctuary where he merges the two rooms together. And then you get to the trumpets, which is this week, by the way. Revelation chapters 8, 2 to 5. An angel receives incense at the altar of sacrifice which represents the prayers of the people. He takes his prayers to an altar, and he hurls his prayers down, and God's fiery judgments on humanity comes down, and seven trumpets are shouted out. And you're thinking to yourself, whoa, 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 second. Rewind just one moment. I know you're rushing through rather quickly here, but, but did I hear this right? Did, did Pastor Japheth just say that, that God is, is hurling down judgment and fire? Uh, did, I, did I miss a link? I, I, man, I, I should have read the Daily Walk. 
Maybe, maybe that would have helped me understand what's going on here. Let me, let me check the worship guide. And do you guys, by the way, have your worship guide? Uh, you'll, you'll need your worship guide. If you don't, put your hand up and we'll make sure you have your worship guide. So you go and you, you'll want a worship guide. If you don't have one, put your hand up and we'll make sure you have one. And you're thinking to yourself, uh, you need a worship guide. Hey, by the way, Rod, did you want a copy of the manuscript? I have a copy for you on the front row here. It's just waiting for you, so you have to come down, though. Yeah, yeah, just come down. Andrea's got a copy for you. So uh, the, the worship guide's right here, and then you're thinking to yourself, oh, my goodness, uh, where is, where's the title here? And you look at it, and you're thinking, it says, Radical Warning. Radical Warning? Man, I, I don't know. When I thought a Radical Warning, I was thinking maybe like, you know, like on a clothes warning that says that if you put this clothing in with light colors, it could turn white clothing into pink clothing. So I was thinking more that kind of warning. I wasn't thinking of a warning that says, alert, 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 run to the mountains and hide. But this sounds kind of like fire and judgment. So I'm kind of a, a little bit worried right now. So let's go to question number one to kind of address this, right? Because question number one is probably going to help us address all the fear that we may be presented ourselves right now, since these trumpets seem kind of scary at the moment. It says here, question number one, and it's the recalibrate questions that I think are worthwhile looking at. If the sanctuary, all right, in the Bible means God dwelling with us, and just so you remember this, that in the Bible, God said, I want you to create a sanctuary, and it means so that I may dwell among you. If the sanctuary means God dwelling with us, how can all this scary stuff be associated with it? I think that's a pretty valid question, right? So we have to kind of break this down. We have to ask ourselves, do we understand the incense and why the angel had to kind of like hurl it down at the fire, right? Why did the incense have to do that? Why did he have to throw it at the earth? Number two, why was he blowing those trumpets so loud, so, so hard? Couldn't he just email us or, or text us or, or just, you know, whisper to us? I mean, he did that with Elijah. I mean, right now, I, I enjoy the churches and the seals, but this trumpet thing is kind of intense. And then when you read Revelation, you read about, oh, I don't know, you read about stinging and sulfur and teeth and a bottomless pit and an abyss and death. And I'm sensing this is not really a children's story right now. So I'm not really feeling that this is really about Jesus. When I, I was talking to Tom Eichmann the other day, and he was telling me that when he was a kid, he had some trouble sleeping. So his parents gave him some cassettes where, they would where he would listen to Revelation cassettes to go to bed every night. And I was like, seriously? This is where you, 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 you'd like... I mean, you put, and you, if you may not know what a cassette is, but it was very cool. Uh, and he put a cassette in, and he'd listen to the abyss, and the, and the dragon came out of the abyss, and, and the sulfur, and, and there was tormenting. And I'm like, and this is what you went to bed at night? I'm like, it may have affected him. But he's a surgeon now, so I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, so these are things that are good questions, right? And you probably have your own set of questions. I'm pretty sure when you've read these chapters on the trumpets, you're thinking, I, I got some questions myself, and I'm sure we do, right? So we have to ask ourselves, well, what do we know so far? Well, we know that the gospel was sent and it was received through the seven churches, and we remember this, that as it was sent, and as we failed as churches, Jesus stepped up. You remember last week I showed you a slice of the cake? <sighs> that cake, still can't have any. Um, so a uh, slice of the cake, the, the metaphor was that the, the cake represents our time, and each slice represents an era of the time, and I pulled out one slice of the cake, and I said, the bottom layer represents the churches, the middle layer represented the seals, and the top layer represented the trumpets. So the gospel has been presented through the churches, and the churches did pretty well, but when they failed, Jesus stepped up. The seals is God's people, the followers of Jesus, as the gospel was presented to them, 
uh, and if they didn't pick it up, the Holy Spirit is the one who's been nudging them so that they would seal themselves inside the strawberries and cream. They would seal themselves inside there, and as they would be sealed in, in the truth, they would be faithful to God. But the trumpets, the trumpets are these really heavy layers. It's cream and, and butter. It's supposed to give you a heart attack, right? It's a heavy, heavy message begging the community to repent because probation is going to close. And I know it's heavy, and I don't blame you. So we need to unpack all of this, but we must never lose sight that probation will close. Shocker alert, right? Grace one day will end. Grace one day will end. The world will end. People are going to stop suffering. Wars will be no more. Diseases will be gone. Those shootings that took place yesterday and last night, they will be over. Cancer will be removed. Divorce will be banished. Abuse will be squashed. Children will be free. No more graves. Deep final choices will have to be made. It is a radical warning. And I kind of like that. I kind of like that it's a radical warning. Because I want someone to tell me. So question number two. And this is a hard question. And I, you will have to wrestle through this, as I have wrestled hard through this this week. When has a warning made you change? And when has a warning made you stubborn? All right? When has a warning made you change? And when has a warning made you stubborn? I kind of like it when uh, I'm, I, I get a heads up of things. When there's a speed trap ahead, right, and you're driving along and somebody flashes you, your immediate reaction is, why are you flashing me? And you get irritated that somebody would flash you. And you think to yourself, my reflexes were not fast enough to flash them back. But as you go round the corner and you see the speed trap, aren't you thankful that you slowed down or that you were driving at the right speed limit in the first place, which would have been much better, right? And then you're like, oh, great one who flashed me. I give you my firstborn. I dedicate him to you. For the rest of my life, he is yours. Farewell, Joshua. I mean, that's what you do, right? Because, because you're just like, you're thankful for this. So you, you kind of understand this. So a warning and method can seem harsh at first, but when you see the benefit of it, it's all worth it. Now, that, of course, is a very minor scale. This, of course, is a global scale because we're talking about eternity. <laughs> we're talking about eternity. And Jesus, my friends, is waiting. He's waiting, and he's waiting as long as he can to give everybody the chance to hear the gospel, to make a choice to choose freedom. You remember, right, the 75% of this comes from the First Testament? Well, I need to refresh your memories a little bit. So in order to really understand what this radical warning really feels like, you need to understand some of these larger questions. I have to kind of break this down. So when you read the text right at the beginning of Revelation there in this section of the trumpets, you need to understand what happens to this angel so you don't feel kind of just as radical in weirdness, but radical as in good, radical warning as in, I want this to happen. So, every day, morning and evening, in the past, there would be a sacrifice, a lamb on the altar. The priest would come, and he would take some coals from this altar and some incense, and he would take it from the altar, and he would go into, towards the most holy place, and he would place some of the incense on the altar, the golden altar before there. Then he would return with this, with this uh, censer, with this censer, and he would come, and he would smash these coals onto the ground. Okay, And as he would smash this on the ground, it would make this noise on the ground there, and it would signify that the sacrifice had been heard, that judgment had been declared, that God had forgiven you, that the daily had been done, that justice was dealt with. And it was beautiful, and this happened morning and evening. Now, this is beautiful. Very close to John's time, as John's penning this, 
the Mishnah, which is a, a collection of the rabbinic writings of the oral traditions of the Jews at the time. The Mishnah records, very close to this time here, that there was a spade that the priests used called the Magrepha. You want to see this? The Magrepha. You want to repeat it with me? Magrepha. That's very good. I like how you guys said that together with me. Let's try it together. Magrepha. My goodness, you guys are in sync. I feel the energy. Let's try that again. Magrepha. All right, so the Magrepha was this spade that the priests used. It was a very special spade that they, that they would take the coals from. In fact, they would pierce this spade with tons of little holes all the way through, and each hole was a different pitch, a different note. And as they would take these coals, and as they would smash these coals down on the ground, it would create a different note. Each of these notes was like a huge organ symphony was being played as it would smash down. So it was like a huge orchestra would be played at this very point that it would smash down. It was recorded in the Mishnah that once they, they, the priest came down, that the sound was heard 15 miles away in Jericho. Right? This is the daily sacrifice, morning and evening. It was as if the bells in the sanctuary were ringing, saying, worship has begun. The morning and evening. Basically, as Ezekiel 10, 2 says, it was a beautiful thing. It was just telling you that God was saying, every morning and evening, I'm calling you to worship. That's what the sensor was of coming down, saying, God is saying, something amazing has taken place. And that was what the coals were coming down for. Now, I want you to take that and place that into your memory bank. Somewhere inside your brain, just put it inside a post-it note there and put it there if you have to write it down like me, because I memorize things better when I write it down, then write it down on a piece of paper on your worship guide, put it there. Let's go to the trumpets. I want you to look up Numbers chapter 10, verses 8 to 10. It's on page 131 in your Bibles. Numbers chapter 10, verses 8 to 10. Page 131 in your Bibles. And while you're looking that up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up a critical word to you. This word is remember. Remember. I want you to remember the word remember. See that? It's good, isn't it? I like to play on that. Critical word, remember. In the First Testament, so many incredible stories are tied to this word. And if, if you want to ever sit down with your children and you want to tell them a series of incredible stories, then this is maybe where you take out your pen and your worship guide or your phone and you write down these passages of Scripture. This is just a little side note. It's good for you because Numbers is going to talk about this, but I want you to write down these texts for you. Because the word remember is a significant word, and God uses this lots of times in the First Testament. Genesis chapter 8, Noah. Genesis 19, Abraham. Genesis 30, Rachel, Exodus 2, Moses, 1 Samuel 1, Hannah. All of these stories, the word that pops up is remember. Genesis 8, Genesis 19, Genesis 30, Exodus 2, 1 Samuel 1, remember. Get them all? They're all connected to the word remember. Now let's go to Numbers, chapter 8, verses, 10 to, uh, verses 8 to 10, page 131. Numbers, chapter 10. Verses 8 to 10. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpets. The trumpets shall be to you for a perpetual statute throughout your generations. And when you go to war in your land against the adversary who oppressed you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, that you may be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. And on the day of your gladness also, and at your appointed feast, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings, and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord your God. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, this is just an ordinary trumpet, so I'm going to borrow microphone D, and I'm going to invite Greg to come up here. Can I... Thanks, Andrea. And uh, this is actually uh, a miniature version of the, the trumpet. It's actually a shofar. Uh, it's a ram's horn. Thanks to uh, Patty and Peter last night around uh, midnight, who said, hey, I have one of these. And, uh, and I was like, great, bring it. 
And, and then, as I was sitting down here, Patty says to me, you know, I think Greg knows how to blow on one of these. It's great. So I ran over there during Kids Life. Greg, can you make this work? And he went out there and he made it work. So this microphone is to kind of give you a taste, because these were much, much larger. And this was the sacred instrument uh, that they would use to call on God. Because when they called on God, God would remember them. And they would remember that God remembers them. So I'm going to use a microphone here. Is this on, actually? Testing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh sure. Of course, Jim. Oh, ye of little faith. I know, I know, I'm growing. All right. Oh, that's pretty impressive, eh? All right, yeah, yeah, thank you, Greg. That's pretty cool. All right, all right. So this thing was blown, and, and that sound was seared into their memory every time they went into battle, every time they, they thought of God, they would blow this. Every time they needed to connect, they would actually do this. And it was incredibly tied to all of their memories, this horn all the time. It was victory was theirs, this trumpet, was the shofar was blown, battles were won, sins were forgiven, deliverance from their enemies. In fact, prayer and trumpets went hand in hand. And this is very important. Prayer and trumpets went hand in hand. They were never scared when they heard that sound. That sound brought joy to their life. When they went to the Battle of Jericho, that's the sound they heard. When the Ten Commandments was delivered, that's the sound they heard. And they're told that when the second coming of Jesus comes, that's the sound they'll hear. So. When you think of incense and trumpets now, and you hear that the, the angel rises and stands on the altar, right, and he takes this, this incense, and he hears the prayers coming forward, and as he hears the prayers of everybody crying out to God, saying, God, how long? And they, these are people who are saying, God, your gospel is going, but they're not responding to this, and they're working against us. In fact, 50 million followers of Jesus have been killed during this period. 50 million Christians, because they've been faithful to the Bible have been executed, and they've been praying to God, saying, God, how long will these people rebel against listening to the word? God sends his trumpets, this radical warning saying, I need you to stop killing these people who are faithful to me, and I need you, a radical warning, to repent and come home. This is the radical warning. He takes this coal, this incense, and he slams it down and says, I will send this judgment on you. Repent, listen to this sound. The prayers are heard. Come home, come home. That's what he's saying. The difficulty is that repent and come home for us, we, we don't associate it with all the weird words that come afterwards, right? The language that follows is this sulfur and teeth and bottomless pit and abyss and death. And we kind of get into literalism and we forget the book was written symbolically. But if I explain a few of these, I'm going to go through them pretty rapidly to kind of just give you a gist. I think that if I explain a few of these things to you, it will help you understand what they mean, and then it will put you a little bit at ease and understand still yet how radical the warning actually is. And you can then go into the daily walk, you can look at the commentaries, and you can kind of break them down yourself. So symbolically, always remember this. The C... Uh, basically meant this. It was pulled from the First Testament, and it represents the people, but in particular, those who reject the gospel. So the sea represents uh, those who rejected the gospel. The ships on the sea represents those who are very arrogant, who, who have pride and self-sufficiency. The mountains represented the kingdoms, and the third, whenever you read about the third, it represented a very small amount. So when it says, and the dragon was angry, and it, with his tail, he took a third of the the angels with him, it basically meant that he took a little, a third, a small amount of the angels with him went. So let's read Revelation chapter 8, um, page 1134. It's the last book in the Bible, should be easy to find. Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 to 9. Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 to 9. The second angel blew his trumpet. 
Something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. People who've read that normally are like, whoa, this is horrible. God is like destroying things and making a sea go full of blood, and this is just terrible. No, it's supposed to conjure up an image of the plagues of Egypt. It's supposed to trigger a thought that something terrible is taking place here. But what happens here is this. God is reminding them that there is an empire that has been persecuting people who are faithful to God. And he's saying that a third of this empire, the pride of this empire, remember the ships, the, the, the great glory of this empire, is going to be humiliated. They're going to be humbled a little bit. They're going to be reduced. And I'm going to let you work out which empire you think it is. It starts with the letter R, it ends with the letter E, and it rhymes with dome. All right? It starts with R, ends with E, and it rhymes with dome. I don't know. I mean, you just you, you go work it out, and you let me know who you think, which empire that was. But that's the empire that, that this is referring to. And so he says, this empire was hurting Christians, and because of this, God is saying, I'm not going to let it hurt Christians anymore, and I'm going to humble this empire. And in an attempt to get this empire to start to listen, that in fact, one day, probation will close. Grace will come to an end. The wars will end. Cancer will be done with. Abuse will end. And I need people to make a radical choice. It gets a little bit complicated, and because of time, I'm going to actually have to press on a little bit faster with this. So we'll skip over a few more of these trumpets here, and I'll press on a little bit faster with this. But here, this period all the way through, people have struggled all the way through with these trumpets. And some of the trumpets dealt with how people actually uh, have rejected the Bible. And as they rejected the Bible, they've rejected truth. They've rejected it because they said, I want to be, become a little bit more skeptical. Uh, and by being skeptical, we've tried to imply that we are more intellectual. Well, God says, no, I want you to be intellectual. I want you to come and reason with me and discuss things with me rather than presume that you are above me. Rather than to presume that you know more than me, use the intelligence that you have and let's engage with each other inside it. Be intrigued by God. We've actually got to the point where we don't believe really in truth and what we've done is we've become extreme with fundamentalism. We've become extreme with terrorism and we've sanctioned it with this extremism. We get online and we say all sorts of horrible things about each other behind the computer screen because we feel we can. We've lost respect and dignity and we've embraced uh, a secularism. And with the rise of secularism, we have become more self-centered than ever before. It's incredible, right? The seven churches, the seven seals, and now the seven sent trumpets. And what is central to all of these? Jesus is delivering the same message with a different method. Every time he's saying, come home, connect to me, and we can make this work. Repent before probation closes. And this is, by the way, my last radical warning. 17 years ago, I think it was about then, I think Josh wasn't born uh, this time, just about the time, I was driving home, and it was Friday night, and I just, I want to preface this um, so you understand how important this was. Friday night is very important to me because uh, I keep Sabbath, and Sabbath for me uh, starts Friday night, and I, and I just, side note, uh, in, in the Bible, in creation, God talks about the day's beginning, uh, and it was evening, and it was morning and it was evening, and it was morning. There's a rhythm, right? But the reason evening and morning means that the day begins with sunset to sunset. So that's why I keep Sabbath from Friday night to Saturday night, right? So I keep Sabbath, the end of the, the seventh day that way, and it was Friday night, so it was Sabbath for me. I just finished a church, and uh, closed up with the church, the youth program, very happy, and it was just, it was, Friday night's just this kind of like fresh, breaks bread, feeling of warm fire. If you imagine that kind of glow, that's the way I felt about that Friday night. I was super happy. I locked up the church, got in my car, and took out my Nokia phone. I don't know if you know what a Nokia phone is, but it was a very cool phone 17 years ago. Uh, it, had a, it had a game on it called Snake. Snake followed a pixel. I don't know if you know what a pixel is, because today, if you saw a dot on your screen, you'd be like, is it dirty? <laughs> 
But in, in my day, a pixel was very cool. You would actually expect to see pixels on your screen. And so this, this uh, snake was uh, the coolest game. It just followed a pixel, right? So I, I switched on my Nokia phone, and I played the song, and I was driving, uh, driving home. And I could have driven through Abbott's Langley and King's Langley, which are lovely little villages, but I chose to drive through the A41, the dual carriageway. I drove in my Rover 216 GTI, five-speed gearbox. Uh, this is the last English car ever made. Um, I have taken this car. She and I had been all over Europe together. Uh, we had raced a, a BMW M3 in Germany and lost. Uh, we had raced a, a Golf GTI in Belgium and, and lost. And now we were on the A41 in Hemel Hempstead, Hertfordshire. And we had no one. So we were going to win. And, uh, and it, was, it was beautiful. And I, I, was, just, I was enjoying the road. And, and, and then I noticed there was a competitor with me, and, and we were having fun. And, and what I need to know is that Hertfordshire is, is a very, uh, very, lots of valleys. And so as you drive up this hill, uh, you'd go down and up and down. And so I'd see the competitor behind me. They were going up and down. It was just beautiful, right? And, and we, were, we were racing through this valley, uh, heading home. And, and it, I was. 120, 130 miles an hour, right? So this is, a, this is like maxing going up there, you know, 120, 130 coming down, 120, it's just like peeking out all the time, just enjoying this, right? And, uh, and then I, I noticed my exit was coming up quite soon. And uh, it's a manual gearbox, as a car was created by God to be. Uh, and, uh, and so I don't use the brakes, I just downshift and I exit out, and, uh, and as I come out of this road, and it's, it's dark, right, so I come out of the jewel carriageway dark into Hemel Hempstead Town, which is all lit up. So I move out of darkness, which is metaphorical, into light. You see this? Darkness into light. I move from this dim carriageway into the light of the city. And what dawned into the reality is the car as it followed me uh, into here, and I looked in the rear mirror, and I saw this car, and it was a Volvo. A Volvo? A Volvo of all things that kept up with me? How, I mean, if it was a BMW M3, but a Volvo? How dare this thing think that it was equal to a Rover 216 GTI? And this Volvo blacked out behind me. As it drew closer to me, I noticed that uh, on the top of this Volvo was a very thin, very thin plastic uh, clear glass all across the visor. And, and out of the darkness, this, this clear glass had lights, LED lights in it. <laughs> and they, they came on. And the, the color from the black matte finish on this Volvo that was turbocharged was blue and red. And so blue and red, flashing, flashing, flashing. So I pulled over, he pulled over. And in England, you, you get out the car. So I got out the car, and uh, I stood out the car, because you don't do that in America, I know that. So I jumped out the car and uh, stood out there. They, two officers, got out. And they got to the back of their car, they opened the doors, and they put on their jackets, and they button up each button, one by one. I'm pretty sure they polished each button first, right? <laughs> like, hey, you got any brass polish? Yes. And they polished every button. Then they put on their flat cap. Uh, if they had top gun glasses, they would have put them on. And then they militarily, they turn, and they start to walk towards me, right? And so they walked towards me, and, uh, and they, uh, as they approached me, um, I, knew, um, I knew it was the end of the world. Uh, you see, in England, if you go, it, the speed limit on a dual carriageway is 50 miles an hour. And uh, if you go over the speed limit, like double, um, you lose your license for a year automatically. And then you have so many points on your license uh, that, I mean, you're just busted for your life. It's, it's, it's a long road to recovery, because I knew several pastors that had this problem. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's not funny, man. They were on the Lord's business. Um, 
And uh, so I knew several pastors that, 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 that lost their licenses and they were on bicycles and trains and all sorts of stuff, but lost their license because if you double it, you lose it. So I, I, I was there and, and they marched over. One of them was then circling my car, checking for, for like damaged lights and anything they could ding me on, right? Like there wasn't enough already. And the other guy grabbed my driving license. And as he looked at my driving license, he noticed that I didn't indicate that I was Mr. I was not Master. I was Reverend, Reverend Japheth Jelvinson de Oliveira. He then asked me some questions about where I was, and I told him I'd been at church and leading a youth program, and he was so angry. He was so angry. But it was, it was anger and it was disappointment. He said, you are a bloody idiot, right? And then, and then, he strung together uh, a series of French words um, in, in a way that, that Shakespeare would have blushed. I mean, it was just, just one after another, and I was just like in awe how he put them all together and without taking a breath, just and, I just, and just told me off. And, and, and at the same time, he said he'd just left hospitals this week. That night, where because of idiots who were racing and driving, their kids had died and body parts taken off the streets. And I mean, just horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. And how could I? And what a, a model of a, of a past I was to kids. And, and just, I mean, laid everything into me about this, right? And but then, but then I mean, and I'm just mortified about this. I mean, it's horrible. And I know my life is over at this point. And I'm thinking, okay, how, how am I going to get home? Is he going to put me in prison for the rest of my life? I don't know what's going to happen with this. And then he tells me, but because of uh, the hills, and because of the darkness, and because of the camera, and because of the, I was up and he was down and we were up, uh, he was not able to capture my speed. But he knows, and I know, that you were doing 130 miles an hour, but I'm going to let you go. Now get out of here. Now that is a radical warning. Isn't it? Isn't it? That's a radical warning. If ever you could imagine one, that's a radical warning. That's just crazy. Because that's what happens with the trumpets, right? When it talks about trumpet number five and it talks about five months, it's triggering you back to Noah's flood. It's trying to say to you, you're inside the ark. You realize you're stressed about it, but I'm telling you, while everything's going on around you, I need you to make a choice. You're safe. I'm kind of trying to shake you up, but make a choice. Stop this. And I have tried, believe me, I have been much, but if, if that hadn't happened in my life, I don't know whether I'd be alive today. Because the way I drove 17 years ago, people are scared today. People be horrified 17 years ago. I mean, it was a wake-up call then. And I can tell you this. I could tell you, I could say to you, uh, well, his method was inappropriate. Uh, I didn't think it was very kosher. I didn't think his language was very appropriate. I thought it was a bit borderline racist and, and abusive and sexist and, and very rude. And, and I mean, so many French words, and we don't like the French anyway. I mean, it's just, it was just terrible, right? And I was intimidated, and I was bullied, and I felt raft up, and, and he was standing very close to me. In fact, I, I felt like his saliva was on my face quite a lot, right? Right? But I needed that wake-up call. We need that wake-up call. Question number three, and our last question for this morning is this. Who needs the trumpet the most in your life? You or someone else in your life? I know that you're thinking straight away, I can tell you who needs the trumpet, Pastor. <laughs> who needs the trumpet? Everybody raise your finger and point. And you can tell me, right? Do you need the trumpet in your life? Well, for far too long, my friends, I think we have found that we have been a people who want Jesus uh, to keep him at a safe distance from us. Yeah? It's true. For far too long, we have been a people who want Jesus to keep a safe distance from us. And that's why, to our shame, to our shame, uh, we have made Jesus weak. I'm constantly in shock. We have made words like doctrine and church and truth and policy very, very strong. But Jesus... 
oh, that's just pre-K stuff. That's just pre-K stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, it's time to put everything in its right place. That's what it is. The radical call of Jesus brings a radical warning in your life. So, doctrine, if it does not bring you to Jesus, it brings you to human secular power. Did you see that? If it does not bring you to Jesus, it brings you to human secular power. Church, if it does not bring you to Jesus, it brings you to human secular power. Truth, if it does not bring you to Jesus, it brings you to human secular power. Policy, if it does not bring you to Jesus, it brings you to human secular power. Jesus never said, if you lift up doctrine, if you lift up church, if you lift up policy or truth, he will draw all humanity. He said, if you lift up Jesus, you will bring everybody. And he's calling us to be faithful to him. When you get to the last two chapters of Revelation 10, 11 in this particular week, he basically describes the condition and mission of our church. He says that it is very, very important for us. And next week, next week we're going to enter into a major, major prophetic element of the book of Revelation. And I, I need you to read the daily walk and look through all the examples to try and understand the hope inside there. But for this morning, what I want you to think about as you listen to the scripture that Patty had read for us so well, the angel holds that scroll in chapter 10. That message, that gospel is sweet. But sharing it is hard, hard work. And it feels bitter at times. And it's difficult. It's difficult for you to hear it. It's difficult for others to hear it. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Remember when I uh, said that I had to go um, see my doctor the other day? Um, and uh, my doctor asked me, uh, he asked me this question, he said, uh, so uh, tell me about uh, exercise, you know, uh, how are you doing with uh, regular exercise every day? And, uh, and I said, oh yeah, and I looked at my watch and I said, uh, I got a lot of uh, exercise. Uh, it says that I breathe, um, and my watch says that I stand up, my watch says that I uh, move, I have movement, and then Scott DeRude is like, no, I mean, no, pastor. I mean, sustained 30 minutes of physical activity. 30 minutes of physical activity a day? Are, are you okay, doc? I mean, uh, what are you thinking? I mean, that's, a, that's a, an extreme view, don't you think? <laughs> maybe, we should, uh, maybe we should do some research on that. <laughs> uh, so he gave me a plan to kind of work on that. And, and I know, I know. You, we don't want these radical warnings in our life, but we need that. I sat down with the elders this Tuesday, uh, and we, we talked about vision and stuff, but I also said to them, I want a one-on-one -on -one checkup with every elder. And they're all, like I was running away from my doctor, they're running away from me too. Um, and I said, I need to know if they're just ticking along or whether they're growing. And I know some of them are growing exponentially, but I want to make sure that everybody has something, and I'm sure I will learn something from them that I'll be able to help others as well. But that's what the Bible's for. Um, and sometimes it can feel overwhelming. Where do you begin? How do you get into this? So I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by this. And uh, if you feel overwhelmed, then I want you to reach out and let me help you. Let me help you so that you can get into this and we will break it down so it's actually easy. Um, as we were getting ready for Bike to Work Week, right? Um, and uh, it, was, uh, it was on Wednesday, so I knew that I had to ride the bike. I had to ride to work as well. So I started to ride to work like five, six days in advance in preparation so that on bike to work day, I could do it as well. It'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it, if we did bike to work day and I drove? Uh, <laughs> so uh, so as the first day I rode with Jonah and uh, I was, as I was riding, I came up Iris where uh, Audrey and Bob and Jeanette live there and uh, got up about halfway up the hill and their hill's really nice until about halfway, then it's, it's Satan designed it. Uh, and, <laughs> and as I got up there, uh, I had to stop. And Jonah was like, rushed up the top. And I looked at my watch, and my watch said, your heartbeat is uh, 167. So I, and I knew my heartbeat was high because I was like, <gasps> like this kind, right? And it was actually far worse than that. This is actually gentle. 
So Jonah's like, Daddy, you're okay? Like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, just uh, wait. So about two hours later, uh, he said, hey, Daddy, you okay? I said, 165. <laughs> so uh, day four, day four now, I'm going up the hill, and uh, made it all the way to the top of the hill in gear one. All right, um, people are walking past me with their Zimmer frames. All right, they're like, how are you doing? I'm on my bicycle, I'm doing a fight. And they're like, okay, they're going to pass me in their Zimmer frame. So I get to the top of the hill, like five o'clock in the morning, and I'm at the top of the hill, my heart rate now is now, after five days, my heart rate is now 165. Very proud, two beats faster. So 165, and I'm sitting down there at the top on my handlebar by myself, and this dear old couple, uh, come by, and uh, they are perplexed now. They look at me at the top of Iris, and they're walking on forth here, and they're like, are you okay? And I, and I looked at them and said, it's a good thing, Davor. <laughs> Davor, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Right? When you get into the Word of God, that's a good thing. Good to feel your blood rushing. Difficulty is that um, our mind wanders, and uh, we, we're sometimes overwhelmed by the idea of getting into Bible study and getting into the Word of God, and it's overwhelming. I mean, when I said to Scott, I said, oh, exercise 30 minutes a day, Ooh, Christmas time, I'll start then. New year, next year. He's like, well, let's start slow. Yeah, it's very slow. Uh, but when you get going, it's a good thing. And I want you to experience it's a good thing. And I don't want you to wait until next Sabbath. I don't want you to wait until next week. I don't want you to wait until Sunday. I don't want you to have to go spend an hour praying about this. I don't want you to go through a Bible study. I want you to take out your Connect card today, right now, and decide to make it a good thing. So you may have been a follower of Jesus all your life, and you just feel like it just hasn't been a good thing in a long time, then let's just start it again and make it a good thing. And we'll go at the pace that makes sense to you. And I'll help you open this word up again and make it a good thing because it's a good thing. Take that card, put it in the altars all around here, and we'll connect with you this weekend. And let's celebrate together. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for the radical warning of the trumpets, for our prayers that have been heard, for those who are rejecting the gospel, God, but you are pleading hard with them in methods that we struggle to understand, God, with, with actions that we struggle to understand, but we know, God, that these things, these methods actually work because you are begging them to come home. God, may they come home. May we come home because it's a good thing. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen.